Section 1 of An Alphabet of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Gonzalez An Alphabet of History By Wilbur D. Nesbitt Alexander the Great Alexander the Great was a victim of fate, and he sighed there was naught to delight him when he brandished his sword and defiantly roared, and could not get a country to fight him. All the armies he chased, all the lands laid to waste, and he clamoured for further diversions, and our history speaks of his grip on the Greeks, and his hammerlock hold in the Persians. Though the Gordian knot, cut in two, in a spot, in his palace was labelled a relic, though the Bezephalus stuff gave him fame, he was huffed, he was grouchy and grumpy, was Alec. And the cause of his woe, he would have you to know, was the fact that he never was able to conduct a big scrap that a versatile chap of a war correspondent would cable. Instead of being quite glad, he would grow very sad when he told the fellows who fought him, as he thought of the lack of clicking Kodak in the hands of a man to snapshot him. We are told that he wept, in a dolefulness crept. For his palace, the reason is hinted. There were not at that time magazines for a dime, and his articles could not be printed. Though it may seem unkind, ere his life we've outlined, we must say in some ways he was hateful, and in truth, we have heard he went back on his word, and was not Alexander the Grateful. End of section one. Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavite, Philippines. Section two of an alphabet of history. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Niedermeyer. An alphabet of history by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Brutus. Back in the time of Rome sublime, there lived great Julius Caesar, who wore the crown with haughty frown, and was a frosty geezer. Three times, they say, upon the way, called Lupercal, they fetched it, for him to wear, but then and there, he said, they should have stretched it. And we are told that jewel was cold and frigid as Alaska, ambitious too, that would not do, for Cassius and Casca. They told the friends, it all depends on having things to suit us. We think the jewel is much too cool. Let us conspire with Brutus. They furthermore let out this roar. Shall Caesar further scoff us? Next week, they say, he'll have his way about the Rome post office. With dirk and sword in toga stored, you know, those times they wore em? They made a muss of Julius one morning in the forum. With edge to brute, J.C. crew mute. Some claim it's edge to brutey. We mention it both, whole and split, as is our bounden duty. Mark Antony arose and he talked some, we shall not quote it. We've understood twas not as good as when Bill Shakespeare wrote it. Then Brutus skipped, lest he be nipped, and since his dissolution, he's been accused and much abused in schools of elocution. End of section 2 Section 3 of An Alphabet of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Christopher Columbus When Christopher Columbus stood the egg upon its head, he solved a weighty problem that no one could comprehend. Perhaps it was the puzzle whose solution clearly showed the psychologic motives of the hen that crossed the road. Perhaps cold storage minstrels never might have heard of this, if it hadn't been for Chris. Columbus packed his little grip and got upon the train, and went to see that noble man, King Ferdinand of Spain. Result, he found America, oh, do not idly nod, for if it hadn't been for this, we couldn't go abroad. Just think of all the travel and the voyages we'd miss, if it hadn't been for Chris. Columbus found America and won a lot of fame. 
Nobody ever thought to ask him how he knew its name. Nobody ever booked him for some lectures to declare, in eloquent assertions, how he knew the land was there. Today we might be savages, unknowing modern bliss, if it hadn't been for Chris. He landed near Havana, and he said, It seems to me that sometime in the future little Cuby shall be free. His vision was prophetic, far adown the future's track. He saw the dauntless Hobson and the sinking Merrimack. We might have still been tyrous in the ethics of the kiss, if it hadn't been for Chris. Today there are big cities and big buildings named for him, and yet he was so poor that once he thought he'd have to swim. To find this wondrous country, for he was so badly broke, but Isabella nobly put her watch and ring in soak. Who knows but Isabella never might have thought of this, if it hadn't been for Chris. End of recording. End of section 3. Recording by Gregory Eccles, South Africa. Section 4 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ipa Gonzalez. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Diogenes. Diogenes live in a tub. His fellow is analyzing. This verse were carved upon his club. First class philosophizing. If any question came his way, involving people's morals, the things that he felt moved to say, were sure to start some quarrels. In fact, his job became a booth, in which he dealt in wholesale truth. This world was but a fleeting show. He knew a lot about it. When he was told a thing was so, he then began to doubt it. He seldom left his narrow home, not even on Sunday. The only time that he would roam abroad was on a Monday. He had to roam then anyway, for that, you know, is washing day. Society, with all its sham, gave him a paroxysm. He always spoke in epigram, and thought in aphorism. One day he took his lantern down, and polished it, and lit it. But first he frowned a peevish frown, and growled. The victim fit it. And then, with pessimistic scan, he sought to find an honest man. Diogenes has long been dead. His search was not well heeded, for no historian has said, if ever he succeeded. But there's this talk for you and me. It would not be quite pleasant if all that quest to say should be, with his fair slight at present. For if he were, one may but think how much that light would make him blink. End of section 4. Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavite, Philippines. Section 5 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Euripides Euripides of ancient Greece excelled in things dramatic. He could sit down and write a piece mild-tempered or emphatic. The dramatists of modern days, no matter how much they write, can never equal Rippy's ways, for he was quite a playwright. When Rippy took his pen in hand, the scenes would flow like magic. Though humor came at his command, his penchant was the tragic. He often wrote a little speech that was extremely pleasant. His jests were lasting. All and each are still used at the present. Euripides was serious. He thought he had a mission. He said, By writing thus and thus, I'll elevate the Grecian. However, though he oft produced his works in manner spurty, he never wrote a thing to boost the vogue of ten, twent, thirty. In fact, his works could have been played in goodly style with no girls. He never used the soubrette maid or based his play on showgirls. And this, for old Euripides, in none of all his dramas did he observe the modern pleas for chorus in pajamas. Euripides was Athens Fitch, or her Augustus Thomas, 
It's really hard to say just which, but he was full of promise. It's time that Rippy had his due, and got his share of glory, for royalties he never knew, and no press agent's story. End of Section 5 Recording by Bob Gonzalez Section 6 of An Alphabet of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Niedermeyer An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Franklin Fame twined the wreath on Franklin's brow, a many years ago. And yet, how many people now the reason for it know? Was it because he wisely wrote, Poor Richard's Almanac? One of the few we pause to note which testimonials lack. Was Franklin's fame the sure result of his philosophy? No mental cure or psychic cult or great uplift had he. Was it because for years and years he was a diplomat? Why, no, what person ever hears about such things as that? Then what did wise Ben Franklin do, that he should merit fame, that each edition of Who's Who in bold type puts his name? He flew his kite, he had the key, his front door to unlock, like countless other men than he acquired a sudden shock. The trolley cars and dynamos and incandescent light and buzzing fan which coolness blows all date from Franklin's kite. But what an oversight of fame! Ben Franklin's wife, twas she, that thoughtful, gentle, kindly dame who let him have the key. End of section six. Section seven of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Galilei Galileo. Galilei Galileo was an early man of science. He was happy when inventing or discussing an appliance. Pendulums he found by study were precise in every wobble, showing how old Father Time went in his never-ending hobble. Galilei Galileo the thermometer invented, and informed the gaping public what its figures represented. "'Oh, you foolish Galileo!' cried the public. "'You shall rue it. Why get up a thing to tell us we are hot? We always knew it.' Galilei Galileo took a tube and got some lenses, and discovered things that made him rather disbelieve his senses. He would point his telescope up to the sky, and then he'd scan it, then go into breakfast smiling, for he'd found another planet. Galilei Galileo viewed the luminary solar, that's the sun, and found it spotted on the belt and regions polar. But he didn't figure out that when the sun was thickly freckled, then the world with lights and fusses was continually speckled. Galilei Galileo wrote a thing and then denounced it, but we often read his name and wonder how the man pronounced it. Maybe when he tried to he was all at sixes and at sevens, which is why he turned his studies to the dim and distant heavens. Galileo, Galileo, what a musical cognomen! Possibly some bright librettist will find in this name an omen, that presages fortune for him, and the stage will pay what we owe, to that honest old star-gazer, Galileo, Galileo. End of recording End of section 7 Recording by Gregory Eccles, South Africa Section 8 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Hippocrates. Hippocrates was father to an awful lot of bother, for tis claimed that as to medicine he was the pioneer, that but for him the surgeon, or the latter-day chirurgeon, might never have been tinkering the human running gear. Hippocrates' diploma never threw him into coma in his efforts to decipher what its classic diction said. For when he was seeking practice long ago, the simple fact is that the Latin tongue was common and was very far from dead. He often growled dadgummit when he felt the glossy summit of his head, which was as bald as any shiny billiard ball. But old Hip had to endure it, for he knew he couldn't cure it, and that once his hair was falling, why, he had to let it fall. 
He was written up by Plato, who was quite a hot potato, when it came to mental effort, for you know he reasoned well. Plato praised his diagnosis, called him Healing's patient Moses, and though facts were hard to gather, found a goodly lot to tell. Hippocrates had knowledge, though he didn't go to college. He could speak of all diseases that he knew in Latin terms. Still, twas only second nature to affect that nomenclature, but he never even thought of, much less heard of, any germs. Streptococcus or bacillus, such as get in us and kill us, to Hippocrates were always undiscovered and unknown. And the grim appendicitis, which today is sure to fright us, was by Dr. Hip considered but a stomach ache groan. Were he living at this moment, would the world be in a foment? Would physicians of the present take him out to see the town? From New Jersey clear to Joppa, not a one would call him Papa, and his theories and treatments would be greeted with a frown. We must say that he was clever, and that in one way, however, he resembled all the others who are treating human ills. He was constantly complaining that in spite of all his training, he could never cure his patients of the trait of dodging bills. End of section 8. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Section 9 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Section 9. Iago. The Scheming Iago. Iago, as a villain, was a master of his craft, and yet he did not work at all as modern villains do. No one can rise and say that bold Iago hoarsely laughed when some one demonstrated that his stories were untrue. He did not swagger on stage in evening clothes and mutter, nor bite his fingernails in baffled anger now and then. He never turned and left the stage with nothing else to utter except, Aha! Proud beauty! I shall not be foiled again. Iago did not hover near the old deserted mill to hurl the daring hero in the waters of the race. He never frowned, and ground his teeth, and burned the hidden will, or kidnapped any children just to complicate the case. Iago was not like the villains that we have at present. He didn't even try to scowl or look the part. Iago, as a villain, was continually pleasant, and never gave the notion that he had a stony heart. Othello was his victim, and Iago's work was good. But still Iago doesn't seem to get the proper praise. Othello, as the hero, as all proper heroes should, stood calmly in the spotlight and corralled the wreathing bays. Since then, there is no villain of the art of good Iago. At least we haven't seen an actor who approached him yet. The villains we have noticed from Galveston to Chicago have hissed through black mustaches and have smoked the cigarette. End of Section 9 Recording by Capricia Page Section 10 of an alphabet of history. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. An alphabet of history by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Section 10. Johnson. Johnson entertaining a lady. O oh, rare Ben Johnson, you who wrote to Celia, 
presager of that later note, Bedelia, to you, rare Ben, our hat we raise, for all your poems and your plays. You knew, forsooth, if Shakespeare's work was taken, like copies by a scrawling clerk from Bacon. You would have known of that flim-flam without a hidden cryptogram. O oh, rare Ben Jonson, with your pen you labored, and with brave lords and gentlemen you neighbored. You never turned out a feeble farce in sentences that would not parse. To managers you ne'er were made to grovel, and, Ben, you never called a spade a shovel. Where you wrote sentences risque, we now have costumes very gay. O oh, rare Ben Jonson, when you asked that lady to drink, her name you never masked as Sadie. Nor did you call her Creobel, or half the song names we might tell. Drink to me only with thine eyes. Your sighing showed you no steins of any size were buying. But from the way the stanzas run, you, rare Ben Johnson, were well done. End of section 10 Recording by Capricia Page Section 11 of An Alphabet of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Kid Oh, William Kidd was a pirate bold, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. He sailed the seas in search of gold, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. He sailed on both sides of the line, the skull and bones he made his sign. Where he found wealth, he said, that's mine, three centuries ago. Oh, William Kidd was a pirate bad, three centuries ago. A very dark repute he had, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. He'd board a ship and take its hoard, then, walk the plank, he fiercely roared, the ship is all that I can board, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. Oh, William Kidd was a pirate great, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. He said, I'll rob you while you wait, three centuries ago. He had a long, low, rakish craft, with long toms both before and aft, and wickedly and loud he laughed, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. Oh, William Kidd was a pirate big, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. He feared no frigate, bark, or brig, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. And while his grim flag flapped and tossed above the ship that Bill Kidd bossed, his victims knew just how they lost three centuries ago. Oh, William Kidd was a pirate then three centuries ago. If he should come to life again, yo-ho, my lads, yo-ho. The chances are that he would just go out and organize a trust. He knew the way to raise the dust three centuries ago. End of section 11 Section 12 of An Alphabet of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Section 12 Lucullus Lucullus was a fighter for a portion of his life. He won the bay and laurel by his prowess in the strife. He came back home a hero, and no doubt just as to-day. They named a cocktail for him ere they looked the other way. But when Lucullus noticed he was losing grips on fame, he struck a happy notion to perpetuate his name. He took to giving dinners in a palace he had built. Tis said that lots was eaten, and a sea of wine was spilt that guests might order anything in dishes old or new, and get the very rarest, and a second order, too. Quick lunches or coarse dinners, anything a man could wish, in the line of drinks or dainties, yet he was no nouveau rich. Lucullus won great battles, 
victories that he might boast yet to-day we recollect him merely as a lavish host it is said that once he ordered quite the richest feast prepared but no guest came to enjoy it and the busy chef was scared is nobody here for dinner asked the flustered pestered chef i am dining with lucullus roared lucullus are you deaf but we think that one great reason for his never dying fame for the pure unfading lustre of his dinner-eating name is that though lucullus feasted at a very great expense and sat down to simple breakfasts where the health foods were immense he was gracious to his fellows was considerate of each and he never put his chestnuts in an after-dinner speech End of section 12. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Section 13 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Methuselah Methuselah lived long ago, he was the old inhabitant. Those times but never had a show, his opportunities were scant. Although he lived nine centuries and threescore years and nine beside, the time he saw were not like these, a chance to spread he was denied. He could not seek the corner store and lunch on crackers, cheese and prunes, and there display his helpful law through mornings and through afternoons. He could not talk about the days when folks first saw the telegraph or telephone how their amaze made better posted people laugh. He could not take the stranger out to some tall building, then say, Here, and for a good ways hereabout, I used to shoot the bear and deer. Skyscrapers were an unknown thing, excepting Babel in his land, and Babel only served to bring speech that he could not understand. Perhaps this Babel item is anachronistic, as to that, we'll say one pleasant thing was his, he never had to rent a flat. Another joy in his career was this, nobody ever told Methuselah the stated year when he should be considered old. At thirty-five he was not barred from working if he wanted to. He did not need a union card, his daily labours to pursue. And when his hair was snowy white, and age his manly form had bent, Nobody called him young and bright and ran him for vice president. End of recording. End of section 13. Recording by Gregory Eccles, South Africa. Section 14 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Newton Now Newton in the orchard felt an apple strike his head. "'Tis gravity, tis gravity!" excitedly he said. Had you or I been sitting there a-thinking of this earth, as Newton was, and wondering about its size and girth, and just when we were figuring a long and heavy sum, the apple hit us on the mind and made our bald spot numb. We say, had you or I been there, as Newton was that day, would there have been much gravity in what we had to say? This shows how great it is to have a scientific mind, an intellect that reaches out to see what it may find. Perchance an ordinary man in such a circumstance would have got up and rubbed his head and done a little dance, and muttered things that gentlefolks should scarcely ever state, and not concede the apple simply had to gravitate. Again, we say, if Newton's place was held by you or I, instead of gravity we might have thought of apple pie. You see, again we make the point that scientific minds discover fact which any brain that's common never finds. You see, when Newton felt the jolt, his science did not stop. He simply meditated on what made the apple drop. And while in cogitation deep beneath the tree he lay, he mused, it's odd that apples never drop the other way. Once more, if you or I had been beneath the apple tree, we might have howled, who was it threw that apple and hit me? To finish this, however, with becoming gravity, we'll state that Newton lingered there beneath the apple tree. 
With logarithmic tables, he discovered that the speed at which the apple fell was based on whence it fell. Indeed, had it dropped from the moon, we'll say, it would have grown so hot that it would have been melted up before to earth it got. Again, and finally, had you or I held Newton's seat, we should, like he did, take the apple up and start to eat. End of recording. End of section 14. Recording by Gregory Eccles, South Africa. Section 15 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Section 15. Omar. Old Omar, in a tent he had to live, yet gave to verse such time as he could give. Whereat the critics rose and hurled at him, The stuff you write is only tentative. Yet Kayam never worried over that, He kept his troubles underneath his hat, Except such times as when he worked them up Into an apt and pleasing rubaiyat. Fitzgerald, the translator, took his pen And made a flowing version, yes, and then, To show he could keep it up a while, Translated all the rubaiyat again. Now, is there any home that don't reveal, O Kayam's volume, resting, by Lucille, Bound in limp leather, with each edge uncut, To show the literary sense we feel? And is there any town from York to Boot, Wherein some maiden fair don't elocute, Through Kayam's easy-speaking poetry, With musical accompaniment to suit? Ay, verily! And where the parodist who does not seek through all upon his list, And come back at the last to Kayam's work, Each time to find new chances he has missed? A good cigar, a ready fountain pen, Or a typewriter one can use, And then a book of Omar whence to draw the thought, Oh, parodies one will turn out again! Some black initial letters here and there, Perchance he also had each hubbard hair, but anyhow, old Kayam set a task to fill all his successors with despair. End of section 15. Section 16 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Peeps Perchance, when he was working on the diary that bears his name in those far days, now dead and gone, he never dreamed about his fame. Yet now, from time to time, it is heard from most everybody's lips, that magic, mellow name of his, the soft and pleasing name of Pips. Again, when reading what he wrote, we live anew that ancient time. The book is one we often quote. The cheap editions are a dime. We mark his course through dingy streets, and climb with him the palace steps. In fancy all of those one meets remark, why there goes Mr. Peps. He always had a seeing eye and hearing ear, and what he saw and what he heard he fain would try to set down, but evade the law. And that is why in cipher dark the tale originally creeps. T'was thus also he made his mark, this man of truth and trouble, Peeps. Throughout his life he had his griefs, and also had a little fun. He kept his eye upon his chiefs, and tells the things they might have done if they had not done what they did. Ah, if each person now should keep his own diary and raise the lid, as did this honest Samuel Pepys. And so, you see, he made a name whereon the critics sometimes pounce. It hardly ever sounds the same. It is so easy to pronounce. But still there is an hour or so of pleasure for the man who dips into his book 
and comes to know good Samuel peeps, peps, or pips. End of section sixteen. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. Section seventeen of an alphabet of history. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Section 17. Quintilian. Quintilian, years and years ago, was it on oratory. Demosthenes and Cicero, he studied con amore. He ran an elocution school and taught the Roman lispers, the reason and the rote and rule for requesting father, dear father, to come home with me now, in most pathetic whispers. Twas he who showed that thus and thus one should appear when stating the last remarks of Spartacus on ceasing gladiating. Perchance the word we just have used escaped your dictionary. We mean when Spartacus refused to be butchered to make a Roman holiday exceedingly exciting and otherwise gladsome and merry. Quintilian's book on how to speak is classic at this moment. It tells the speaker when to shriek and when his rage to foment. The boy who on commencement day cites Patrick Henry's speeches must do so in Quintilian's way when a single order of liberty with a supplemental second choice of death he beseeches. The actor who would thrill the crowd, a blood and marrow freezer, by handing out in accents proud Mark Antony on Caesar, must heed the rules set down by Quint, and so must he who rises to heights of glowing fame by dint of the justly famous to be or not to be, center of the stage to spotlight sizzling, when he as Hamlet soliloquizes. Quintilian, we are fain to say, was it on oratory, and even in this later day receives his share of glory, except when elocutionists are peace and comfort mangle by showing how fair Bessie's wrists were strained and bruised while swinging around in the belfry the time she said the curfew should not jangle. End of section 17. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Section 18 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Section 18. Rawley. Sir Walter Rawley was a man of excellent deportment. He could advise a king or khan what going into court meant. When Spencer wrote his fairy queen, Sir Walter Raleigh said it, Betrayed a whip both sharp and clean, We wonder if he read it. Good Queen Elizabeth one day was out, Perhaps for shopping, And Raleigh chanced along the way, Where she in wrath was stopping. How can I get across that mud? She asked, And in the muddle Sir Walter showed his gentle blood, His cloak soon bridged the puddle. A smile replaced the good queen's frown. She paused there for a minute, To set more straight the royal crown. It had no hat-pin in it. And then she murmured low to Walt, Sir, you shall see my tailor. He answered, If I'm worth my salt, Good queen, make me a sailor. And so good queen Elizabeth gave him a high position. He drew his pay like drawing breath, and led an expedition that sailed across the raging seas for gold and slaves and cocoa, and battled with the biting breeze along the Orinoco. Alas, it may have been the cloak that was in mire embedded, or possibly some words he spoke that made him be beheaded. But let us learn this lesson here from poor Sir Walter Rawley. The favour of the great, tis queer, oft has a grim finale. End of section 18 Section 19 of An Alphabet of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Shakespeare. Shakespeare, as all of us have read, once asked, What's in a name? An alias for the rose, he said, would make it smell the same. But Shakespeare was so frivolous. Excuse us if we say that it has always seemed to us his work was mostly play. As Shakespeare, 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 too, his signature is found. His autographs are much too few to be passed all around. This shows the cumulative worth of honest, solid fame. The bidders come from all the earth to buy his misspelled name. He dramatized the thrilling scene where Caesar met his end, where Casca, hungry, lank, and lean, and Brutus, Caesar's friend, stabbed swiftly with their daggers bright when Julius came in reach. Then Antony, thrilled at the sight, arose and made a speech. No chorus girls were in his shows, in them no social queens were given princely wage to pose and dignify the scenes. But there be those who say there are odd facts that can't be passed. For instance, oft we see a star with ciphers in the cast, and this leads many to declare that Bacon wrote the shows, a cryptic secret hidden there they say they will disclose. It may be that each drama hoards a Bacon cryptogram, for often, proud upon the boards, there struts and strides a ham. End of section 19 Recording by Bob Gonzalez Section 20 of An Alphabet of History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Niedermeyer. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Tell. The tale of Tell is simply told. He would not heed the tyrant. But big and brave and bluffly bold, he spurned the cold aspirant. He simply came out plain and flat and his own rights defended. He would not bow to Gessler's head, upon the pole suspended. Then Gessler came upon the scene, and ordered Tell to knuckle. Tell fixed him with his glances keen, and gave a scornful chuckle. Then Gessler frowned and knit his brows, a most portentous omen. Risk your boy's life, or make those bows. We've lost the boy's cognomen. Tell smiled and got his trusty bow, likewise his trusty arrow. Now, William Tell, as you should know, could wing the fleeting sparrow, or he could truly shoot the chutes. So Gessler said, Now grapple, with this one fact, for you the boots, unless you cleave the apple. Did Tell succeed? In your school books the tale is very well told. And Gessler looked some haughty looks, when he heard what Bill Tell told. What did you hide this arrow for? asked Gessler of the wizard. I meant to split the apple or I'd have to harm your gizzard. That's all, except it shall endure, as acted by Salvini, but was it? And the overture, composed by one Rossini, shall prove that Tell is not a myth, concocted to deceive us. We've seen the bow he did it with. We hope you will believe us. End of section 20 Section 21 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Section 21 Ulysses Ulysses and Circe with his crew as hogs Unusually popular with mythological misses, and rather want to wander when he should have stayed at home, we find is why our hero, the redoubtable Ulysses, went rambling into trouble when he thought that he would roam. Penelope, good lady, left behind in their apartment, 
had trouble in her efforts to get cash to pay the rent. Telemachus, their skian, knew not then what being smart meant. He should have helped his mamma, but he never earned a cent. Ulysses, in the meantime, found the land of the Cyclopses, and came within an ace of being made into a stew. He drugged old Polyphemus, then skedaddled with, I hope he's laid up with indigestion, and went onward with his crew. From there he ambled farther, till he reached the realm of Circe. We translate rather freely from the Odyssean log. She proved to be a lady with no tenderness or mercy. Each comrade of Ulysses, for her sport, was made a hog. He got away, however, and steered his trusty ship, so that it would take him quickly where more trouble might be found. He grounded on the island of the nymph they called Calypso, and dallied in her presence till eight years had rolled around. Homesickness must have struck him, not so many years thereafter. He sighed. I think the time has come for me to pull my freight. The listeners had trouble, when they tried to hold their laughter, at thinking of how long it was before he knew it was late. Penelope, fond woman, had been wooed by many suitors. To each and every one of them she firmly whispered, No. Ulysses, on appearing, changed the suitors into scooters. He strode into the parlor and said, Take your hats and go. Old Homer tells us fully how Penelope received him, and how to give her pleasure all these stories he would weave. He also tells us solemnly Penelope believed him. That portion of the Odyssey we never can believe. End of section 21 Recording by Capricia Page Section 22 of An Alphabet of History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Fraze. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Section 22. Villon. Villon, bard of the early times, familiarly called Francois. "'Twas he who juggled so with rhymes "'that we regard him now with awe. "'His Pegasus knew G from Haw. "'He drove with all a jockey's art "'and ran each race without a flaw. "'Villon gave these ballades their start. "'Must he flee to some safer climes? "'Did hunger at his vitals gnaw? "'Or was he jailed for varied crimes? "'In that he inspiration saw.' and pen held in a grimy paw would let his flashing fancy dart. Oft times in measures rather raw, Villon gave these ballades their start. His purse was ever bare of dimes. He often felt the grip of law. Yet he the jolliest of mimes who slept most nights upon the straw, and wakened to the raucous caw of ravens never shirked his part. He never stopped at fate to jaw. Villon gave these ballades their start. L'envoi Princess, the moral's here to draw. When poets go into the mart, the editors say coldly, Shaw! Villon gave these ballades their start. End of section 22 Recording by Dan Fraze Section 23 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Niedermeyer. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. What? When what was but a little boy, his papa's pride, his mama's joy, he sat beside the kitchen fire, the bubbling teapot to admire. 
and as he watched the hissing steam he straightway then began to dream of what the vapour hot could do if how to use it he but knew eventually he devised a neat invention which surprised the people of that early day he made an engine anyway this poor contrivance he improved until by it great loads were moved and horses were displaced by rails while side wheels took the place of sails observe my child how one small thing a wondrous lot of change will bring because wise little jimmy watt could turn to some account his thought to-day the drains go whizzing through the land and over the ocean blue the mighty ships good night and day from here to countries far away great thanks are due to this jim's watt also to his mamma's teapot by porters who on every trip hold up the tourist for a tip and also by that mighty mass of folks who travel on a pass and by that ones who rake in rocks through squeezes that they work in stocks but that it would like punning seem we'd say what has the world's esteem but since we've said it that way now we'll let the pun go anyhow but somehow when we chance to stop beside some busy boiler shop we cannot say that peace was brought to all of us by jimmy watt End of section twenty three Section 24 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Alphabet of History by William D. Nesbitt. Section 24. Xantippe. Xantippe was the lady who was wed to Socrates, and their life was not a grand sweet song. "'Twas a study, just a study, done in all the minor keys, "'with the gloomy measures turned on strong. "'When old Socrates was busy at the office, "'she would wait till he ambled in at three a.m., "'and she met him in the moonlight, twixt the doorway and the gate, "'then the neighbors heard a lot from them. "'But Socrates, he didn't mind when she pulled out his hair, "'when she would box his ears for him, he didn't seem to care. "'In a manner bland and wise, he would then philosophize on the whyness of the witchness of the neither here nor there. Xantippe did the cooking, and we have to tell the truth, indigestion quickly seized on him, and in one of her biscuits on a time he broke a tooth, yet he smiled across at wifey grim. When she tried her hand at pastry was the only time he spoke, and of course he had to make a break. "'Twas perhaps the first appearance of the everlasting joke "'on the pies that mother used to make. "'Poor Socrates, he never even ducked his head or dodged, "'but merely rubbed the spot whereon the flying platter lodged. "'Then he murmured, "Zanty dear, you have made a problem clear. "'Then he went to get the swelling on his cranium massaged. "'Zantippe wouldn't let him smoke at all about the place, "'and she wouldn't let him take a drink. "'He never learned the value of a two-spot or an ace.' for most all that he could do was think. Thus you see that though Xantippe has been fiercely criticized, yet she really made her husband's fame, for t'was while she bossed him sorely that the great man analyzed all the subjects that have made his name. Xantippe made him famous, but for her the man had been forgotten like the others of the time that he lived in. Oh, my darling, such a help, he most gratefully would yelp when she gave him an impression with a busy rolling pin. End of section 24. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Section 25 of An Alphabet of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kim K.G. An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Eve Toe There was a king of Eve Toe, and easy was his head. Serena's rest, not would suggest the words so often said, that crowned heads are not peaceful. He never wore a frown. He laughed away the night and day with gaily tilted crown. The jester of his palace was never forced to work. He never had to make things glad with oily smile and smirk. This jolly king of Eve Toe had no need of his fool. He made his own jests from the throne, and pleasure was his rule. He never had a quarrel with any other king. 
Why should we fight? he asked. Delight is such an easy thing. He told no one his troubles. In truth, he reigned so well, no one could know, in fair Evto, of troubles fit to tell. The little realm of Evto, a wee spot on the map, has made a name secure in fame because of this rare chap, who put his crown on sideways and lulled upon his throne, with scepter set so that it met his active funny bone. He was to war a stranger, his kingdom had no debt. Each of his laws possessed a clause that barred out care and fret. Tis told that when expiring he wasted his last breath in one long laugh in life's behalf, and thus went to his death. There was a king of Yuto. There are such kings today. They never sigh for things gone by, but laugh along the way. So crown yourself with laughter, put pleasure on the throne, and you'll possess, in happiness, an Evto of your own. End of section 25 Recording by Kim K. G. Section 26 of An Alphabet of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kellyanne Hoover An Alphabet of History by Wilbur D. Nesbitt, Zenobia Zenobia was empress of the people of Palmyra. She tried to boss the army when she should have stayed at home. Aurelian, the soldier, led a sort of a hegira of armies up to fight her. They came all the way from Rome. Full soon he was pursuing them with spears and daggers shooing them. At last he sent them to defeat and caught the doughty queen. He captured her regretfully, he said, but she said fretfully that she considered him a spiteful thing and very, very mean. He led her back a captive with her hands and jeweled fetters, though she cast on Aurelian a look of proud disdain. Her manacles were carved and chased and decked by jewel setters, and to securely hold her he had made a golden chain. There is a lot of mystery connected with all history. Zenobia, they tell us, didn't want to go to jail. But think of such a fate as that, why such a jeweled weight as that, was better than to pawn your clothes and be released on bail. Zenobia was taken to the royal Roman palace, and there the charming prisoner, we read, was quite the rage. Had she lived in this time of ours, we say this without malice, she might have made a lasting hit by going on the stage. Aurelian was nice to her. He hinted more than twice to her that he was getting pretty tired of kinging it alone. You see, she might have captured him. Already she enraptured him, and had that handcuffed jewelry to wear upon the throne." But no, Zenobia was like most any other lady. They've been the same since Mother Eve. They have the same way still. No matter if it's Princess May or Susie, Sal, or Sadie, no lady will consent to be convinced against her will. At last they told her civilly, You'll have to live in Tivoli, which may or may not be the way to speak that city's name. She answered very prettily, I'll love to live in Italy, and there she stayed until she was an old forgotten dame. End of section 26. Recording by Kellyanne Hoover. End of an alphabet of history by Wilbur D. Nesbitt.